Good morning. It's May 30th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with the impending launch of a North Korean spy settlement. The North has made clear just this morning that it will launch its first military spy satellite in June. The regime says the satellite will monitor U.S. military activity in real time. President Yoon suk yeol hosts Pacific Island Forum here in Seoul. Seoul and 17 PIF member states adopt a joint statement on deeper cooperation to tackle common global challenges like the food and climate crisis. Russia unleashed drone and missile attacks on Ukraine's capital in broad daylight on Monday. Ukrainian authorities have confirmed two deaths and three injured during two days of attacks. Our top story this morning, North Korea says it will launch its first military spy satellite in June. Now that's as early as this week. The regime has declared the satellite will monitor U.S. military activity in real time. Lee Soo-jin starts us off. Tensions are once again ramping up on the Korean peninsula. High-ranking North Korean military official Lee Byung-chol announced in a statement released by the country's state media KCNA on Tuesday that the country is planning to launch a military spy satellite as soon as June. This marks the first time that North Korea has revealed a timeline for the satellite launch. This comes just a day after the Japanese media reported that North Korea had notified Japan of its plan to launch the satellite sometime between May 31st and June 11. Japan's Coast Guard, which coordinates maritime safety in East Asia, promptly issued a safety warning for ships. In the statement, Ri, the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission of the Ruling Workers' Party, also condemned joint military exercises by South Korea and the United States. He added that the military reconnaissance satellite would be launched to track, monitor and determine in real time the military actions of the United States and its allies. South Korea and the U.S. conducted the largest live fire exercise of its kind near North Korea's border last week, which is scheduled to continue until mid-June. The news of the imminent spy satellite launch drew contrasting responses from the U.S. and China. The U.S. State Department denounced North Korea's threats, warning that it will be held accountable if it actually launches the satellite. A launch by North Korea that uses long-range ballistic missile technology is a violation of the U.N. Security Council's resolutions. Meanwhile, North Korea's biggest ally, China, reiterated its previous stance on the importance of carrying out meaningful and balanced conversations. Its foreign ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said in a press briefing on Monday that China hopes that all the nations involved will understand the crux of the issue with North Korea, strive to reach a political settlement, and address the concerns of all the parties involved in a balanced manner. Ning, however, did not respond to whether the satellite launch is a violation of the UN Security Council's resolutions. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Following Japanese reports that North Korea will launch its first ever spy satellite between May 31st and June 11th, the regime this morning said that the launch will go ahead in June. For more on the latest, we're joined by Mr. Frank Danuzzi from the Maren and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. Before we jump into the North's claim this morning, the North reportedly notified the International Maritime Organization in advance. Now, first off, why is that? Why is it the North notified the plan to the organization? Well, in contrast to the North's more than 100 ballistic missile tests over the last year and a half, when they try to launch a satellite, uh, they're trying to put the best foot forward on the international response. Uh, they're trying to signal to the UN and all parties uh, that this is somehow uh, distinguished from their military ballistic missile launches, and this is uh, somehow, uh, in their minds, uh, justified. So they're beginning to play by the playbook uh, in an effort to minimize the likelihood of severe international response. 
Right, and now we have been just confirmed this morning that the North, North will go ahead with the launch next month, which is just in two days, right? Now, the question is, why is this per period chosen, especially all the diplomatic events that we experienced, the G7, also you and Biden, Gishida Summit, why after all the diplomatic events, why June? High-profile uh, North Korean military actions, such as satellite tests, are very often serving both political as well as military purposes. So you may well remember that 11 years ago, uh, in April of 2012, uh, North Korea first tried to put a satellite into orbit. Uh, and that satellite launch brought about the demise of the so-called Leap Day deal uh, between the United States and North Korea. And it was motivated, likely, uh, by South Korea's competitive spirit against, uh, excuse me, North Korea's competitive spirit against the ROK. Uh, North Korea desperately wants to be ahead of South Korea when it comes to satellite launch capability. And South Korea just put a satellite, uh, seven of them in fact, into orbit uh, uh, about a week ago. So North Korea is motivated here uh, principally by the competitive spirit uh, with South Korea. But there's also a military component. Uh, this satellite may have some limited uh, Earth observation uh, capability, which will improve North Korea's ability to monitor South Korean and U.S. military maneuvers uh, if the satellite functions as planned. Right. There are lots of reasons for North Korea to go ahead with the launch next month. Now, last week, South Korean and the U.S. forces began their live fire exercises simulating a full-scale attack from the north that will run until mid-June. Do you think the North perhaps is taking advantage of this joint drill as an excuse to carry out the satellite launch? It's possible that they may be hoping that China in particular uh, will view a satellite launch in this window mm -hmm. as somehow a North Korean response to a South Korean U.S. provocation rather than a North Korean initiative designed uh, to provoke uh, an allied uh, uh, angry response and sanctions. But I think the principal motivation here has to do with North Korea's competition with mm -hmm. South Korea in space. Uh, and the timing of the launch is likely uh, due to Kim Jong-un's embarrassment uh, that South Korea placed seven satellites into orbit uh, five days ago. And I'm sure that he has instructed his team uh, to rush forward with this launch um, in order to try to save face uh, and, and demonstrate North Korea's own capabilities in space. Right, the space race is real and also comes at a very timely manner. Now, vehicles and movement of military personnel spotted at, in satellite images taken off the medium parade training ground recently are no longer present there. Now, why do you think the reason is? I mean, does that mean there'll be no military parade? What do you think? Well, it's always hard to speculate about future North Korean actions, and many of us who try to do that are often wrong. Uh, but in this case, um, I think that North Korea will very likely proceed, um, and the explanation for why they may have tried to scrub uh, and erase photographs may have more to do with security or something that was revealed in those photographs that they did not want the international community to study closely, uh, rather than a decision to cancel the event itself. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, and North Korea is often uh, capable of surprising us. Sure. Now, before we let you go, briefly, why is the North's spy satellite catching so much attention globally? I mean, other than the fact that it's the first ever their military spy satellite. Well, it is a sign of the advance of their ballistic missile technology. But I do want to emphasize here that the capabilities of any satellite that North Korea would likely be able to put into orbit will probably be less than the capabilities of commercially available satellite imagery that North Korea could purchase. Um, and I also believe that it's important to distinguish between launching a satellite and launching a intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead. Satellites go up and they don't come down unless something goes wrong. Uh, warheads go up and they come down. They have to have a re-entry vehicle. So the technology of that is quite different uh, from the technology of putting a satellite into orbit. Um, and I don't believe that this satellite launch uh, poses any significant military threat to the ROK or to the United States. 
Right, and also it does, it, the act itself is a breaching UN Security Council resolutions in many ways. It is clearly a violation, and the Chinese are out of line if they doubt that in any way. Uh, this satellite uh, attempt, when it comes, uh, will clearly violate um, multiple UN Security Council resolutions, which China itself has signed on to. And so it's unfortunate that the Chinese seem to be willing to give uh, North Korea a pass uh, on, on the satellite launch. All right. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Baltimore this morning. It's my pleasure to be with you and your viewers this morning. Thank you so much. Kamsamnida. President Yoon Suk-yeol is currently hosting members of the Pacific Island Forum here in Seoul in what is his debut as a host of a multilateral summit. Our Kim do yeon has details of day one of the two-day session. Taking a step further as a global pivotal state, South Korea hosted members of the Pacific Islands Forum and pledged to expand cooperation with them in climate change, security and official development assistance. This was the first summit between the two sides and was also President Yoon Song Yeol's debut as the host of a multilateral summit. Attending were 12 heads of state including leaders from the Cook Islands and Palau while other nations such as Australia and New Zealand were represented by their top ministers. Calling them close neighbors, the president wished to point out that both South Korea and the Pacific Islands are facing similar issues. According to the joint statement and action plan that was announced following the summit under the theme of navigating towards co-prosperity, strengthening cooperation with the Blue Pacific, the two sides will build on their diplomatic ties based on freedom, peace and prosperity. Tackling climate change as a region sees the direct effect of rising sea levels as well as devastating hurricanes was a priority, along with the sustainable use of marine resources. In addition, Seoul will double the budget for official development assistance provided to PIF members. According to the Korea International Cooperation Agency, as of August last year, South Korea spent nearly 200 million US dollars in the last 30 years on ODA in the region. They also address issues in security, saying solidarity is key and jointly condemn North Korea's recent provocations. Honorable leaders, as the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war has shown us, regional and inter-regional cooperation is essential if we are to build a safe, secure and prosperous world. And now the South Korean government will be switching focus to convincing the visitors to support Busan in the city's quest to host the World Expo in 2030 with 11 votes from Pacific Islands forum members available. In fact, the visiting leaders will head down to Busan on Tuesday to tour potential expo sites. According to the top office, during the bilateral summit, some countries have already shown support for the bid, including the Marshall Islands and Papua New Guinea. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. And ahead of hosting the inaugural Korea-Pacific Island Multilateral Summit, President Yoon held one-on-one -on -one bilaterals with 10 leaders of Pacific Island countries. Our top office correspondent Oh Soo-young has this report. President Yoon suk yeol held bilateral talks with leaders of 10 Pacific Island nations, deepening South Korea's engagement with its neighbors in the Indo-Pacific. On Monday, he sat down with the leader of the Cooks Islands, which is currently chairing the Pacific Islands Forum, and the Prime Ministers of the Marshall Islands, Solomon Islands, Niue and Palau. They discussed South Korea's official development assistance projects in their countries, including water management, renewable energy and resource development, and expressed their intent to advance future exchanges and collaboration. 
In particular, Yoon's summit with the leader of NIUE also coincided with the two countries forging official diplomatic ties on the same morning. Reviewing Seoul's bilateral relations with each of its Pacific counterparts, the South Korean leader has put a special focus on climate response, maritime cooperation, public health and development, as extreme climate events threaten the health of Pacific Islanders, as well as the region's economic and social development. On Sunday, he met with Kiribati's president, Tanati Mamao, who expressed interest in South Korea's economic development model and working on advancing the fishing industry and health. COC Savaleni, Prime Minister of Tonga, said he hopes to work with Seoul in the digital sector. Tonga was the first Pacific Island nation to forge diplomatic ties with South Korea in 1970. Meanwhile, Kausea Natane, the leader of Tuvalu, highlighted cooperation on telecommunication facilities, hydrogen exports and decarbonisation in shipping. And the leader of Vanuatu also requested support in future development projects. James Marape, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, said he hopes for investment by South Korean manufacturers and for Seoul to reopen its foreign aid agency in his country. Going forward, President Yoon pledged to develop just and trust-based relations with the Pacific Island countries, all of which now have bilateral ties with South Korea. The leaders welcome Seoul's growing interest in development assistance to their countries. Woo Seung, Arirang News. U.S. President Joe Biden emphasized the importance of alliances to defend democracy. In a speech at a Memorial Day ceremony held at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia on Monday. During his address, Biden also stressed that the U.S. military has long fought for democracy. He also mentioned American troops were stationed on the Korean Peninsula, preserving peace side by side with South Korea. Biden said democracy is America's strength and thanked all the soldiers who sacrificed their lives to preserve democracy. After facing heavy missile and drone attacks over the weekend, Ukraine's capital Kyiv gave under another wave of attacks from Russia. Monday's attacks were also the first to take place in daylight hours in the capital in months. Yi Seng reports. Russia has been ramping up assaults on the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, this month. On Sunday, Kyiv faced heavy missile and drone attacks, and again on Monday, the capital came under another wave of attacks from Russia, this time during daytime hours. According to the Ukrainian military, Russia fired dozens of cruise missiles from strategic bombers stationed in the Caspian Sea. While most of the missiles were shot down, the attacks killed four and injured 25 others in the city in the two days of the assault. The latest attack on the capital was all the more concerning as it marked the first daytime attack in the area in months while streets were full of people going to work and school. The daytime assault followed a massive Russian air attack using drones the previous day. Ukraine says it shot down 58 out of the 59 drones used to attack the capital on Sunday. And with Moscow using Iranian-made drones, Ukraine's parliament voted in favor of a proposal to impose additional sanctions against Iran to stop the transit of Iranian products through Ukrainian territory. Ukraine says Iran has supplied Russia with so-called kamikaze drones, which have been used to target Ukrainian infrastructure, leading to civilian deaths. While Russia has so far launched 16 assaults on Kyiv this month, the Kyiv Regional Military Administration says Moscow seems to be changing its tactics, demonstrating its will to attack the civilian population. Yi Seung-jae, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Matthew Ashley, and we now turn over to stories from around the world. We begin in Turkey, where sitting President Recep Tayyip Erdogan won the re-election over the weekend in a runoff vote. Now, the win means Erdogan will rule for another five years, extending his time in the presidential seat by a third straight term. His success comes two weeks after he failed to win more than 50 percent of the votes needed for an outright win in the first election round. 
According to figures based on 99.85% of the votes counted so far, Erdogan secured 52.2% of the runoff vote against his opposition leader, Kemal Kanadu. Now, he got 47.8%. Now, he described the election as the most unfair in recent years, but didn't dispute Erdogan's victory. Turning our attention now to Kosovo, where at least 25 NATO troops have been injured with clashes and so protesters while defending town halls in northern Kosovo. NATO has condemned the attacks on its peacekeepers as totally unacceptable. The clashes broke out on Monday after the installation of ethnic Albanian mayors. They were elected in an April vote that was boycotted by Kosovo Serbs, who make up the majority in the northern regions. Now, Kosovo declared its independence from Serbia in 2008. Its sovereign status has been recognized by 99 United Nations member states. Russia on Monday issued an arrest warrant for United States Senator Lindsey Graham over comments related to the war in Ukraine. Now, the warrant follows Ukraine's release of an edited video of a meeting between the Republican politician and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Friday. In the shortened clip, Graham says, quote, the Russians are dying, and later in the conversation, says that the U.S. military assistance to Ukraine was the best money we've ever spent. But the shortened video puts the two separate remarks together. Graham responded to the arrest warrant, saying he would wear it as a badge of honor. Zelensky's office on Sunday uploaded the full, unedited clip. And finally, a kitten trapped in a rain pipe for three days has been found alive in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. Rescuers from the animal charity group Animals Lebanon were able to save the kitten on Friday local time using special small cameras to locate the furry feline. According to the vice president of the group, the kitten got trapped shortly after being born. It was reportedly part of a litter and abandoned by its owner. The rescued kitten has fast become popular, drawing attention from volunteer rescuers, the public and even some politicians. It's been suggested that it be named Beiru. Good morning. It's a muggy start to the day, very warm and humid, with the humidity level reaching more than 90% in the capital. And highs will also hike to 29 degrees Celsius this afternoon, with a chance of passing rain later in the afternoon. And right now, wet clouds are dropping rain on Jeju and the south coast. Parts of the south coast are seeing heavy rain of 15 millimeters an hour, which should gradually let up this morning, but Jeju Island could see on and off rain into tomorrow. The resort island will see rain picking up as the day goes on today with up to 80 millimeters of showers expected. While passing rain is in the forecast in central regions and Jeollado until this afternoon, and it could rain along with thunder and lightning. The regions near the coast will see temperatures on the cooler side with 22 degrees in Busan and Sokcho at 20, and the air quality will be normal to good nationwide all day today. Now, Jeju is forecast to see rain through the end of the week, while the mainland stays mostly sunny with early summer temperatures. Now, that's Korea for you. Here's a look at the international weather conditions. That wraps up today's New Day at Arirang. Arirang News will be back at noon Korea time. Thanks for watching.